you're the host, you would have to say, oh, great. Okay. So I was asked to uh, speak about some of the highlights of Maseches Yubamos that relate specifically to dating and marriage. And uh, I was asked to do so without speaking about Chalitza or Yibum, uh, which is itself a, a very challenging feat when dealing with Maseches Yubamos, which is all about Chalitza and, uh, and Yibum. So maybe I'll start by speaking about other topics. And uh, when we're ready to, um, to finish, maybe mention a little bit about uh, Chalitza and Yibum uh, Bizman Azeh. Uh, so uh, in terms of uh, the halachos that relate to a person being able to date within the Jewish community, marry within the Jewish community. So one starting point is, how do we know that a person is Jewish? So it's a Gemara in Yivamos, a mem vavam and beis, it says, Mishabab Amagerani. The person comes and they say that they converted to Judaism. They started out as an Anju, they converted Yochon the You might think that we would take them at their word automatically, Tamalomer Itcha. So that's why the Torah says, according to the Gemara, the word Itcha, when it's referring to a convert, Itcha Ger When a Ger, a convert lives with you, so the word Itcha has the connotation, that it has to be somebody who has already been established as a, a Jew within the community, but if the person was established not as a Jew, so you can't take their word for it that they're Jewish, that you would be able to date them and, and marry them. So there's a very important tosfos on uh, this uh, Gemara, on the uh, on Mem Zayin and Aleph, the quotes from Abenu Tam, who says uh, that uh, when is it uh, that uh, we have to uh, be stringent for this halacha, that's when the person was muksak as a goy beforehand. If the person was known as a non-Jew beforehand, then he has he or she would have to bring proof for that they converted to Judaism. But otherwise, a person who comes in front of us, they appear before the best, and then they say, guess what, I'm Jewish. And we never knew beforehand that the person was Jewish or non-Jewish. We didn't know anything about the person. So says Rabbeinu Tam, this person would be believed. In fact, Rabbeinu Tam brings a proof in the Gemara in Pesachim that speaks about a non-Jew who would show up in Yerushalayim every Pesach to eat from the club in Pesach, and everybody gave it to him until uh, his ruse uh, was discovered uh, because he gave it away to somebody. But until then, uh, they were prepared to feed him the club in Pesach based on his representation that he was Jewish. And Rabbeinu Tam says, it's not only in Israel with a majority of the inhabitants that might have been Jewish at that time, but rather we have another majority that we rely upon. What is that? The most of the people who appear before us and claim to be Jewish, they are in fact Jewish. Otherwise, people don't make the claim. It's difficult to be a Jew. As we know, there's a lot of anti-Semitism. A person who claims that they're Jewish, they generally can be presumed to be a Jew. So why is it then nowadays, if a person wants to get married, let's say with the, the chief rabbinate in Israel, they want to go to Israel, get a wedding that's endorsed by the chief rabbinate. They want to go to London, have it the wedding endorsed by the London best in Paris, have it endorsed by the Paris best. And they have to come to our rabbinical court or a different rabbinical court for a letter certifying that they're Jewish. Why not? can't they just walk in and say, I'm Jewish? Rabbeinu Tom says that you have to believe me unless you knew for sure uh, that I was a non-Jew. I had a reputation for being a non-Jew. So here, uh, my predecessor, in terms of being the Abbez, then at the Chicago Rabbinical Council, Rabbi Gedaya Dov Schwartz was very, uh, was very fond of quoting from an authority known as the Beis Hillel. He was an early, an early Achron, um, and he brings a Takana, he brings uh, some a type of an enactment that was made in Lita, in Lithuania, this is quoted by the Bear Hayteb in his commentary to Shulchan Aruch Hoshimish uh, Eben Ezer Simon Beis. And he says that if a person comes from another land, hey Nisha Isha, a man or a woman, oh, Bachar or Besula or Alman or Amona, whether they were previously married, they weren't previously married, Sarah or Ayashu Yisrael, they have to bring a proof that they're Jewish. Bavshim is Nagim Kadas Yisrael, even though they act like a Jew. But we just don't know them from beforehand. They speak our tongue. They know all of the practices. They wash nego basu in the morning. They make brachos before they eat. Nonetheless, they need a proof that they're really Jewish. And what family they're from. Um, and um, he says that uh, this was also, uh, this was established as a takana salita. 
that we are not allowed to marry somebody off unless the person is able to bring a, a proof that uh, they were Jewish and from an established uh, family. Um, so, uh, for example, but Moshe Feinstein um, has a tshuva in his Tigros Moshe about a woman who was presumed her whole life to be non-Jewish because her mother uh, practiced um, Christianity, her father practiced Christianity, but now she comes forward and she says, well, my mother was born Jewish, but she converted to Judaism. You have this sometimes. This person says, yeah, they uh, were, were raised by a non-Jewish family during the Holocaust or something like that, or they intermarried and now the child is coming back to the faith. And they say, really, my mother was Jewish. She said so on her, on, 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 on her deathbed or whatever it was. And now the person wants to marry somebody of the, uh, the Jewish faith. So Moshe Feinstein says, based on this Tosos, he quotes this Tosos in Yavamos, and he says that the person who is known to be a non-Jew, even if you would assume uh, that we follow Rabbeinu Tam's opinion that anybody who we don't know one way or another would be believed, this person would not be believed to represent that they're Jewish unless they can bring a proof because of the fact that we had known them to be non-Jewish beforehand. Um, Rav Vadya Yosef, um, when speaking about the Jewishness of uh, the Russian immigrants to Israel, so he has a different angle regarding this. This is in the Abi Omer Chelek Zayin. Um, he says that we essentially uh, accept uh, this opinion uh, that is articulated by Rabbeinu Tam, and he doesn't even, he does, Rav Adya Yosef is the leader of uh, the Sephardic Jewry uh, in Israel. That, he was the Sephardic chief rabbi. He didn't necessarily feel bound by the Takana, the enactments that were made Belita in uh, Lithuania. Um, so he said that even if uh, the people are not observant, um, we can say that if someone represents that they're a Jew, there were plenty of non-observant Jews uh, whose uh, families uh, had assimilated, didn't know anything about Jewish practices. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean um, that we can't trust them. But he does say, <laughs> But if there is very strong evidence um, uh, that uh, there's something suspicious, uh, that uh, there's something wrong uh, in their representation that doesn't compute, it, that doesn't add up, um, so then he says, then you have to do a thorough investigation. And then he added, he originally wrote uh, this response, and then afterwards he added a footnote to this response. And he said, nowadays there are so many people who think that they're Jewish based on mistaken notions of how we define Judaism. There are people in the reform community, for example, who accept patrilineal descent. We know that in order to be Jewish, a person's mother has to be Jewish. It's not sufficient if the father uh, is Jewish, if the mother is not Jewish. So he says uh, that a person might make a genuinely a sincere statement that uh, they believe themselves to be Jewish, uh, but uh, they're basing it upon mistaken premises that they are uh, assuming that because their father is Jewish, therefore that they, they are Jewish as well. And he quotes the opinion of the Ritva, who says, why is it that we fundamentally believe a person to be Jewish? Because it's a milsa David de la Rienshi. It's something which can be investigated and down the road, if the person is lying, they could be found out and then they're going to be embarrassed um, because uh, they, uh, their lie will uh, become uh, public knowledge. So he says here, the person doesn't have to worry about being found out. We'll come back to the person and say, we investigated and we discovered that you're not really Jewish because only your father was Jewish. The person will say, oh, I didn't realize that that's not a true definition of Judaism. Where, where I grew up, uh, that counts as a true definition of Judaism. So therefore it wouldn't lead to any embarrassment. So on that basis, uh, Rabbi Vadya Yosef says that while in theory, we would rely upon the opinion of Rabbi Tam, nonetheless in practice, because a person could make a sincere representation of Jewishness and yet not be Jewish, we cannot rely upon this. Others write that we have so much uh, intermarriage that therefore there's a built-in reyesa, there's a built-in degree of suspicion, even if a person comes from a family that was Jewish and uh, they know a little bit of the Jewish language and Jewish practices, there's so much intermarriage. Rav Yashiv wrote this way in, in his Jubos, um, that uh, as a result, we can no longer rely upon a person's representation um, uh, that, uh, that they are Jewish. Nonetheless, uh, there are certain indications that really emerge from the statement that Rabbeinu Tam said. Rabbeinu Tam said a person who represents that they're Jewish, you can assume that they're really Jewish because most people who represent that they're Jewish are Jewish. So as Rabbi Zohar, Zalman Nechem Goldberg said, nowadays we just have to revise that a little bit. He said that it's not that most of the people represented they're Jewish are Jewish, but Rova Baim Lefeneinu Ban Haga Yehudis Misuyemes, 
most people who come in front of us and they have a certain type of practice of Judaism that we're able to observe. Obali Safa Mr. Yemen. So we see that uh, their grandparents and great grandparents spoke Yiddish. They spoke to, spoke the lingo of uh, Judaism uh, in the communities where they live. Hinam Yehudim. So based on other types of indications, maybe the indications that the great grandparents were buried in Jewish cemeteries. There are indications, but the indications change from generation to generation and from community to community. And you have to figure out what the right indications are. And the, the rabbis work in the rabbinical courts are trained to specialize in how to investigate people from different communities. Um, so they simply have to apply those principles to every single case in order to do a, a proper uh, investigation uh, that a person is really Jewish. There was a recent scandal that was written about regarding a Lebanese man who was not Jewish, who apparently masqueraded as a from Jew, and he married a Jewish woman, and it was in the newspapers, and they spoke about how they need to be more careful in the future. So it's true when you see that a person may come from a community that's not as familiar to you, so you have to consult with the experts from that community. If we have, for example, somebody whose family uh, emigrated from Russia, um, so then we consult with certain rabbis who are known to be experts and have to conduct a proper investigation for people from the, the uh, former Soviet Union in order to determine whether or not they're really Jewish. We have a comfort level with the, those who are uh, American and established in the American communities. We know what questions to ask. We know what indications to look for. Um, so that changes from generation to generation. But fundamentally, we accept the principle of, uh, of Rabbeinu Tam. But there's this notion that the Ramam speaks about of Ma'ala Asu Biyuchsin. Then when it comes uh, to this one thing, to presume that a person is Jewish based on certain practices and certain representations to count them for a minion, but it's another thing to marry them off. But when it comes to marriage, so we say malos to be so that already requires uh, an additional level of uh, scrutiny and investigation. For example, that the Shach says in his commentary to Shulchan Aruch, if you had somebody, you didn't know that they were Jewish or not Jewish, and they say that uh, they converted to Judaism. So had they just said they were always Jewish, you would believe them. So why not believe them as well when they say they were convert? I didn't know that they were convert, but they tell me that they were convert. They converted in front of a proper bezin. So maybe I should believe them. He says, yeah, for counting for a minion, you can believe them, but uh, for marrying them off, uh, so then we have, a, we have a higher standard. But that is with respect to establishing that a person is Jewish. How do we know that a person is legitimate? The Gemara in, in Yevamos in a number of places um, it speaks about and, and, and other places in Yevamos speaks about mamzeris, that a person can be illegitimate, that they could be a mamzer. What causes a person to be um, to be a mamzer? Um, so the Gemara in Kiddushin says, in reality, all families are assumed if they're Jewish within the Jewish community, we assume that they're legitimate. We assume that there's no mamzeris. We don't go checking four generations like uh, the mission at the end of Kiddushin suggests that uh, checking uh, 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 Abi Mos, uh, 80 Mos, you're going to check uh, uh, many generations of uh, matriarchs in order to determine that uh, a person is legitimate. He says that if there's no error, the Gemara concludes uh, that if there's no error, there is to know a type of aspersion that has been cast on a particular family. So we assume that the family uh, does not have a taint of illegitimacy uh, to it. Um, but nonetheless, sometimes the illegitimacy just becomes clear based on the evidence that's compiled by the Besden when they're checking into a certain family. Um, the Mishnah has three opinions of how a person gets to be illegitimate. There's the opinion of Rabbi Akiva, that whenever any kind of negative prohibition has been violated in the course of a marriage, that somebody was prohibited to marry based on a negative transgression, a negative prohibition, a transgression of the Torah. So then a child that's born from that union will be illegitimate, will be a mamzer and will not be allowed to marry freely within the Jewish community. So for example, let's say that a, a man dies without any children, uh, and then uh, the, uh, the wife, the widow, has to perform chalitza with the brother-in-law. She performs chalitza, and then the person uh, marries the woman whom uh, she, he had performed chalitza upon. So there's a pasta, lo yivne es pesach Lo yivne, once kimen shlo bana shuv lo yivne. Once a chalitza has been performed by the oven, by the brother-in-law, he's not allowed to marry his chalitza anymore. If he did so, he would violate a negative, uh, a negative uh, prohibition. According to Rabbi Akiva, if a child is born from that union, that child will be a mamzer. But we don't hold like Rabbi Akiva. We hold like the opinion of Shimon Ateimani. Shimon Ateimani says there has to be an isakari. So it would have to be a prohibited relationship 
um, which was so severe that, that the marriage wouldn't count altogether. It wouldn't be a valid marriage. So like a person tries to marry their mother, they try to marry their sister. Um, and if they would violate that transgression, it would be a type of incestuous relationship where they would get courage. They would get uh, punished from the hands of heaven. And even if it wasn't a type of transgression for which they would be put to death by an earthly court, by the best in here, like a person marries their wife's sisters. That's an issa curries. There's, a, there's, a, there's death by heavenly hands, but not by the hands of a, a Bezdin down on earth. Nonetheless, since it's an issa curries, the, the death penalty through, by heaven, um, that would cause the relationship to produce a mamzer. The case of Mams Davis that we're most familiar with is the case of adultery, that a woman has a, that that's an Isser Kharis, and it's also an Isser Ski, so it's also uh, a, 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 a prohibition um, for which uh, a woman would be, uh, would receive the death penalty. Um, so in the case of, in the case of adultery, if that is transgressed, so then the child would be, would be a Mamzer. So we deal with this on a regular basis. What happens if a woman got married uh, and then she, according to Jewish law, she didn't receive a get from her first husband and she marries a second husband and they have a child. So then that child is presumed to be a mamzer because of the fact that she was essentially committing adultery, whether it was winningly or unwittingly, maybe she didn't realize that she required a get, a Jewish bill of divorce, but the child's going to be a mamzer. So Rav Moshe Feinstein famously would find um, solutions uh, to that problem by saying that if the first marriage, even if it was a Jewish wedding, if nobody was a kosher witness, it was a reform wedding and everybody drove on Shabbos. Um, everybody violated Shabbos. So then technically speaking, they weren't kosher witnesses. So it would follow uh, that uh, the marriage would never got off the ground in the first place because you can't have a valid wedding without kosher witnesses. And said Rav Moshe Feinstein, as a result, uh, if the woman married somebody else afterwards, she lived with another Jewish man afterwards, she wouldn't be committing adultery because she was never married in the first place. So this works um, if there were, in fact, were no kosher witnesses at the original wedding. But sometimes you have kosher witnesses at the original wedding. What do you do in that particular case? So there's a very interesting Gemara um, uh, that uh, where the Gemara tells us in Yevamos uh, that because of the uh, prohibition of the uh, of marrying uh, a, a father's wife is juxtaposed to the prohibition of marrying a mamzer, an illegitimate uh, person, a boy we call a bastard, lo yovo mamzer bikal Hashem, because those two verses are juxtaposed. We say, just like in the case of a father's wife, let's say your, uh, one's father had been married to somebody, but they got divorced. There would still be a, an incestuous relationship to marry the woman, but that's only for the child. Somebody else can marry that woman. So if you have a type of prohibition where nobody would be allowed to marry the person, so then it wouldn't produce mamzeris. What would be the case? They had a married woman who had an affair. Uh, she committed adultery, but not with a Jewish man, with a non-Jewish man. So it's with a non-Jewish man. So nobody in the Jewish community is allowed to marry a, a non-Jew. Since nobody is allowed to marry a non-Jew, so therefore the Gemara says that the child of such a union is not considered to be a mom. It's a very interesting loophole. Um, obviously, it would be a prohibited relationship, but the child would not be a mom's there. So sometimes you have a case. A woman didn't receive a gift from her first husband, then she married a non-Jew, and she has a child. The child's Jewish. The child is Jewish. But nonetheless, the child in such a case is not considered to be a mom's there. So Rabbi Vanya Yosef, would sometimes find grounds to argue who says that we know for sure that the child came from the second husband. So you don't have to do a DNA test. Who knows for sure that the child, we don't know if we don't do the testing that the child came from the second husband. Um, so therefore, maybe the child came from a non-Jew. Now, most posts can say, well, you would need good evidence that the child came from a non-Jew. If the woman was living with a Jew Jewish man and had a child from a second marriage, we would generally assume according to many posts, of course it came from the second husband. We said not so fast. So I actually had a case where uh, there was in the Besden where there was a, uh, a child, a, a, a boy who became a Balchuva. He was born to a, a mother who didn't start out observant. And when he was about 15 years old, the mother realized we have a big problem on our hands because uh, this child uh, is likely going to be considered a mamzer, in which case he won't be able to date freely within the Jewish community because she didn't receive a get from her first husband. Um, uh, so uh, she called up the first husband and said, listen, you didn't give me a get because they had a fight, whatever, at the time. Um, but she being remarried to a non-Orthodox wedding. She got remarried without a get. Um, but she said, now uh, have mercy 
Uh, my child, who's from my second husband, who's 15 years old, and he wants to marry within the Orthodox community, give me a get now so he won't be a mamzer. So the, uh, so the husband said, you know what? I got over whatever it was that stopped me from giving you a get in the first place. I'll give you a get now. So she figured she was very happy. She told the best that now my first husband's willing to give me a get so the child won't be a mamzer. We said, it, it doesn't help. It doesn't help it, 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 if, if the child was conceived at a time that the woman had not yet received her get, even if she receives the get while she's pregnant with the child, the child would still be a mamzer. So it doesn't, it doesn't solve the problem. So if you look at the, the Gemara and Yavamas and Daft Tzadi, it says, well, maybe it could solve the problem. Because the Gemara there uh, talks about that there was a special enactment that was made uh, that if a man appoints an agent to deliver a get to his wife, um, so it used to be that he could go in front of a Bezdin or in front of two witnesses, and he can say, I'm canceling the agent. The agent wouldn't know about it, and it might end to get to the wife anyway, and she'll think that she's divorced, and she's not really divorced because he canceled the agency. So they made a special rule, Baba Gamliel made a rule, that you're not allowed to cancel an agent if it's not in the presence of the agent or the wife, and they won't know that the agent was canceled. But what if a person did? They went in front of a Bezdin, they went in front of even two witnesses, according to some opinions, would be enough. And they canceled the agency. So is it canceled or not? So Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel says, no, the agency is not canceled. Um, uh, that uh, even though the person canceled it in front of a uh, Bezdin, in front of witnesses, nonetheless, we say that it doesn't work. So the Gemara says, what do you mean it doesn't work? He canceled the agency. So the get shouldn't be a good get. So the Gemara says, you're right. The get shouldn't be a good get. But the rabbis sometimes have the power of what we call afkinam aban and the kiddushin mine. They sometimes have the power to say that they're going to nullify a marriage if you have some sort of a get, so that as, the, as the Rashba says, so then they have a, the, the power to say that we're going to consider this get good enough even though it's not good enough. How does the mechanism work? We're going to declare that the first marriage never really got off the ground. We're going to retroactively, that's what it sounds like, we're going to retroactively abrogate the first marriage. So if that's the case, so then under those circumstances that a person would appoint an agent to deliver a get and would cancel the, the agent, not in the presence of the agent, according to Rabbi Shimon ben Gamaliel, the first marriage is considered to be canceled. So that would seem to be a great idea that if you wanted the child from the second marriage not to be considered to be a mamzer, make it so that it will be considered like the first marriage never got off the ground. So the woman never committed adultery, at least retroactively, you're doing away with the adultery. That was the proposal that the Maharsham made based on this Gemara. Um, the Maharsham acknowledged that, that it's only Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel who says that, that the cancellation of the agent doesn't work. The Rebbe, Rabbi Yudha Anasi, said the cancellation of the agent does work. We pass him like Rabbi Yudha Anasi, but there's an opinion in Tosos that says that even Rebbe would agree that if the cancellation took place not in front of two witnesses, but took place in front of one witness, we would say that doesn't work. And the reason it doesn't work, it sounds like Tosis is saying, would also be based on this principle of Afkinam Abana the Kedushimine that the first marriage would be abrogated. So the Maharsham, Maharsham, a great uh, posek from the late 20th century. So he made uh, the proposal that, that uh, in such a case, you can have the first, if the first husband is willing, have him appoint an agent and then, to, and then cancel the agent in front of only one witness. However, the problem with that is uh, that uh, many posts, including Shlomo Zalman Orbach, and the Tzitz Eliezer said it doesn't really work because who says uh, that uh, Rebbe is of the opinion uh, that when you cancel the, uh, the agent in front of one witness uh, that we say that it doesn't work, maybe it does work. And if it doesn't work, maybe it doesn't work because it's only one witness. That generally we say that uh, you want to change a person's marital uh, status or you want to do something uh, that's going to impact on a person's marital status, you have to do it in front of two witnesses. You do it in front of one witness. I don't need a cancellation or abrogation of the marriage to say it's no good. It's just it's, it's no good by definition. Second, and, and thirdly, um, it, it could be that this idea that the rabbis abrogated the marriage is only when the husband is doing something to counter his original intention. His original intention was to divorce his wife. Then when he canceled the agent, he wanted to stay married to his wife. In this case, the original intention of the first husband when he appoints the agent is to divorce his wife. And his intention when he cancels the agent is to divorce his wife. He just knows if I cancel the agent, it'll be an even way, better way of getting rid of my wife. It'll be like the marriage never got off the ground, but it's the same intention that he wants to get rid of her and not stay together with her. So in such a case, as says with Shlomo Zalman Orbach, it doesn't really work. So we had this case and we consulted with Rabbi David Feinstein at the time and said, what does your father, what does Ramosha Feinstein feel about doing this type of a get? 
said he didn't hold by it. It doesn't count for anything. You can't rely upon it. So we were in a difficult situation. However, uh, I interviewed uh, the woman in question and it turned, it turned out that between her first marriage and her second marriage, she had an affair with somebody else who was not Jewish. If she would have had a child with that man who was not Jewish, as we just mentioned, the child for sure, according to the Gemara and Yavamos, would not be a mamzer. Um, uh, so therefore, maybe you can make an argument uh, that uh, since she was with the non-Jew, maybe when she had the child, even after she married the second husband, maybe it was with uh, the non-Jew, that she already had shown a pattern of having relationships with the non-Jews. And I also try to find arguments that uh, maybe uh, even though the first marriage was performed by an Orthodox rabbi, it was out of town, out of town, not everybody in those days was necessarily so observant. And um, it wasn't so clear that, that there was a second witness who was observant, there was somebody who was about Shuva, but then he uh, became uh, un- he, be- he became not observant afterwards. So maybe you can say, what happened to him at the end indicates that really at the beginning he wasn't so observant. These weren't very strong arguments. However, it turned out Rabbi Vadya Yosef was very helpful in this case because what happened was that I fell asleep uh, one night when we, uh, we were working in the, uh, in the Besden on this very difficult case. And um, who should appear to me in a dream but Rabbi Vadya Yosef himself. So he appears to me in a dream. Um, look, I mean, sometimes you, you, you have dreams based on what you're thinking about during the day. So it doesn't have to be such a supernatural thing per se. But in the dream, Rabbi Vadya Yosef said to me, I think he spoke in Hebrew. He said, just write up all of your time in Vinimuk and write up all of your reasoning and send it to me and I'll take care of this. So I wrote up all of my arguments and sent it off to Rabbi Vadya Yosef. And he sent the question to his son-in-law, Rabbi Ezra Bar Shalom, who was a dying at the Bezdin Agadon Yerushalayim, the highest, the supreme rabbinical court in Jerusalem at that time. Rabbi Ezra Bar Shalom liked my arguments and he built upon them and he found other arguments to, uh, to, to conclude that the child, this 15-year-old boy, wasn't really a mamzer after all. And then he showed the tshuva to Rabbi Vadya Yosef and Rabbi Vadya Yosef concurred. And he wrote a concurrence and he said, I have looked over at what my son-in-law wrote and I agree completely with it's a beautifully reasoned and beautifully argued. Um, and, and this boy is permitted to uh, marry with freely within the Jewish community without any doubt or hesitation whatsoever. And Ravavaya Yosef was uh, certainly a formidable enough uh, posek. Uh, that we felt comfortable relying upon him. So this is what we try to do in these types of situations is uh, to find a way out of uh, the Mamzevis problem, but it has to be done in a way that genuinely works. Now, Rav Moshe Feinstein uh, is interesting because uh, afterwards when Rav Yitzchak Yosef, the current Sephardic chief rabbi, was appointed as the chief rabbi, I told him the story. I said, you know, I had this case, uh, this uh, incident where your father appeared to me in a dream and then I wrote to Shaila and he answered and he said, yeah, yeah, that's that's the sort of thing my father would do. Uh, so uh, he felt it was very, very plausible. Um, uh, but uh, there are other uh, types of uh, uh, devices that can sometimes uh, be relied upon. Um, uh, for example, R- 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 Moshe Feinstein points out uh, that uh, there is a comment by Rabbeinu Peretz that says uh, a, a woman uh, shouldn't um, uh, sleep in sheets uh, that were lied upon by another man uh, because when another man lay upon the sheets because uh, it could be that uh, maybe he had a nocturnal emission, his seed will be on the sheets and then it will go into her body somehow, she'll have a child, then she'll have a child from another man and won't know about it. And then uh, one of her sons will go and uh, marry that child who might be a daughter. And uh, and it will, um, or, or one of those, uh, one of that man's sons will, will go and, uh, and, and marry her, uh, her child, you know, who will be born and she'll think it's from her husband. It's really from this man who'll be a daughter and they'll marry their, their half sister. So therefore um, it should be avoided. But Rabbeinu Paris didn't say there's going to be a problem of mom's heiress, that the child that's born is going to be illegitimate. Just worry that the child will marry their half brother or their half sister. So therefore, Ramosha Feinstein says, we see uh, that in order for there to be mamzeris, there has to be a prohibited relationship. If a woman would uh, give birth to a child through uh, the seed of another man um, whom she's not married to, but it would be through IVF, it would be through artificial insemination. So Ramosha Feinstein said that the child would not be a mamzer in that case either. So this is also something contemporary post game have looked into. Um, because let's say you have a, a mamzer, a mamzer, they can't marry. Uh, if you know someone's a mamzer, uh, so they're allowed to marry a convert. But we say, what's the point of marrying a convert? The children are going to be mamzerim. 
um, because it follows uh, the uh, it would follow the, the parent who is a, is a mamzer in terms of the status of the child. Um, you follow the invalidation of either parent. However, says uh, however, if you follow this uh, advice of emotion, some of the contemporary post have spoken about it. You can have a mamzer marry a convert, and uh, the uh, and they'll have all of their children through IVF. And then the children uh, will not be uh, will not be mamzerim according to the opinion of uh, of a Moshe Feinstein. So these are some of the interesting discussions uh, regarding uh, how you make a shiduchim in the current age. Now, um, as we said, if you did have a child who came from a Jewish mother and a non-Jewish man, so then the child is Jewish. But the truth is, this is a big machlokus in several places in Masechus Yevamos, Daf Tezayin, Daf Kov Gimel, Daf Mem Hey talks about Akama Baal Bas Yisrael. What's the status of a child of a non-Jewish man who has a, uh, who has a child with a, Jewish, uh, with, with a Jewish woman? Let's say the Jewish woman wasn't married to somebody else. So it, it's just a regular case. She marries the non-Jewish man. We're not worried about, Mamze, uh, 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 about her committing adultery over here. What's the status of the child? So there are two different opinions in the Gemara. One opinion says the child is a mamzer. Um, that's, uh, Tosu says that would be going according to Rabbi Akiva, since it was a prohibited relationship, therefore the child is, uh, is a mamza. But we don't pask in that way. We all like the opinion that says the child is kosher. The child is a valid, is, is valid. But what does that mean the child is valid? So there's one Tosus in Yavamos and Daf Tezayin and Mabes that says it means the child is not a mamza because they're not Jewish. You can convert them and they'll be Jewish, but they're kosher as long as you convert them. So uh, we, we don't seem to hold that way because the Sugyan Daf Memhe seems to say that the child is 100% kosher, but it's pogum. The child has some sort of a taint. What does it mean the child has a taint? So the Shulchan Aruch Paskins, this means that if the child is a daughter, she would not be allowed to marry a Kohen. So this is a whole big question mark because you have this very often where you have a situation where uh, a woman, a girl is born to a Jewish woman and non-Jewish man. She's brought up as Jewish. And then she was uh, getting, she's dating and she wants to marry a Kohen. So the Halach and Shulchan Aruch is no, the, the, the daughter would be Peguma Lakuna. She would not be allowed to marry a Kohen. Uh, however, uh, the Beis Shmuel points out if she did marry a Kohen, the Ramban says that seems that there seems to be conflicting opinions. In the Gemara, there's one opinion in the Gemara that seems to indicate that the child is completely kosher. So therefore, we say that uh, the child, if they did marry the daughter, if she did marry a Kohen, we wouldn't require them to get divorced. So some of the Sephardic posts given in Israel, including Rabbi Yosef, including Rabbi Shlomo Amar, um, so the, 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 the Havdim and Chaim L'chaim, um, are of the opinion that we say, Shasat Chakid the Ebedami. That just like if they were already married, we wouldn't get have them get divorced if they were engaged or they were in love with each other. Rabbi Yosef would try to find some other uh, some other consideration for leniency. If there was a question whether the non-Jew was really not Jewish, there's a question whether the Kohen's really a Kohen. He wasn't uh, lenient uh, across the board, but others uh, are more comfortable being lenient across the board. They say, well, if it's a very dire emergency situation, so we'll allow the marriage to take place, especially since the Ramam seems to hold that it's completely, it's completely permissible. But Rav Moshe Feinstein, who is generally relied upon by the American post, by the American rabbinate, he says, no, the only reason that we don't force them to get divorced is because since there's an opinion that says they're allowed to be married, we're afraid that if we force them to get divorced, the get won't be valid. It would be a coerced get without sufficient justification. But of course they should get divorced because of the fact that so many of the postkim, the, the Ramban, the, 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 the Tarif, the Rosh, uh, we're all at the Shulchan Aruch, we're all of the opinion that the Kohen has no right to marry such a daughter in the first place. So therefore, we generally will not allow such a marriage to take place at the Chatrila. Let's say it did take place, and then that couple has a child. So is that child considered to be a cholo? Is that child, if the Kohen marries the daughter of a Jewish woman and a non-Jewish man, he wasn't supposed to do it, do we say that the child is a cholo? That the child is uh, considered to uh, be um, disqualified? Uh, from Kahuna, so that that child would be allowed to marry a woman like a divorcee who would not normally be allowed to a coin. So according to some opinions, it's only a big stringency not to allow a daughter of a, not, of a Jewish woman and a non-Jewish man to marry a coin in the first place. It's hard to say that the, that, that, that the child of that union is going to be a cholo. Um, a, even the Ramban, who we, we seem to paskin like, says it's a suffix, it's a question mark. 
So uh, it would be, we had a case like this a couple of years ago. There was a child from social union wanted to, to say he's not really a Cohen and uh, therefore should be allowed to marry a divorcee, for example. And we said, we, we can't uh, allow that leniency. In fact, Rav Yaakov Breish in his Tokas Yaakov says the child of social union would even be allowed to do him in order that to, to underscore the fact that, that we're not taking away uh, the kahuna, we're not taking away the presumptive status of that person that, that they are really um, that they are really a Kohen. Well, but Aaron Soloveitchik used to follow the opinion of the Nesiva Samishpat, who's quoted by the Piskei Shuv, who said that a child of a Jewish um, woman and a non-Jewish man has to undergo some sort of a tefillah, some sort of a conversion procedure. But most posts can say that is not the, the halacha. The halacha is whatever else you want to say about the child. It's a daughter, maybe she can't marry a Kohen, uh, but the child is definitely considered to be 100% Jewish. We don't cast aspersions on the status of a, a child from a, such a, a union in terms of their fundamental Jewishness. That's something that uh, we assume as a, um, as, a matter, uh, as a matter of course. Um, but what's interesting is that in that very same sugya, um, in the Gemara and Daf Mem Hay, when it speaks about, let's say, a child from a, a, who is born from a Jewish woman and non-Jewish father who's not a daughter, a son, you have a son. Uh, so the Gemara indicates that really the, the son is completely kosher and is considered to be Jewish. And according to virtually all we showed him, maybe with the exception of the Ramban, there wouldn't be any taint uh, on this fellow. If he had a daughter, she'd be allowed to marry a Kohen. The Rabban seems to say differently, but okay, everybody else seems to hold that the daughter would be able to marry a Kohen. So, but the problem is there's a stigma. The fellow, there could be people won't, won't, won't want to go out with him because for no good reason. He's a legitimate kosher Jew. His father is his, his father's not Jewish, okay, but his mother's Jewish. He's 100% kosher Jew. He can marry anybody. But it could be people will say, oh, your father wasn't Jewish. I don't want to marry you. I don't want my daughter to go out with you. Um, so uh, one of, uh, a fellow who was in this uh, precarious predicament asked Rabbi Yehuda what he should do. And Rabbi Yehuda said, Zeal Itmer. Rabbi Yehuda said, go and hide yourself. Go to a community where nobody knows your genealogy and you don't have to tell anybody that your father's not Jewish and they'll marry you up uh, to a, a very fine shidduch, uh, any girl, any woman in the community you want to marry uh, that, and it works out, you're compatible, she'll marry you. And uh, just don't give this away because it's going to ruin the shidduch. So the stipler going says from here that we see you don't have to divulge any kind, every defect um, uh, that, uh, that that exists when you are involved with shiduchim. Um, uh, he says, why is that? Um, uh, normally we have a principle of Geneva's das. If I'm selling meat and the meat has a question mark on it, even if the posting will say, yes, yes, you can eat it, then that's going to be the bottom line. Halacha, the Sam Sofer says, you have to inform the consumers. You have to tell them there was a question mark on this meat and you're relying upon a particular leniency. So why is there no Geneva Stas in this case? So Stiplagon says a piece of meat, if you don't buy this piece of meat, you could buy a different piece of meat. When it comes to Shidduchim, it comes to marriage, nobody is identical. Every single person is unique. And therefore, if you can't marry this, if, if somebody won't be able to marry this man, they're not going to find somebody else exactly like this man with all of his qualities and, and, his, and, and all, all of his uh, good, um, uh, good points and um, uh, all of uh, his uh, wonderful, um, wonderful attributes. Um, so, uh, so, so therefore, even if there's something wrong, if the wife would only find out that the father was not Jewish after she was married, she certainly would not divorce him on that basis. So he says, as long as she wouldn't divorce him, once they're already married, he doesn't have to divulge the information before he's married. And the stipler going relates this even to a man who has your know, pardon in the language, he has only one testicle. Uh, so uh, according to the, Rabbeinu, the, the opinion of Rabbeinu Tam, um, especially if it's a, the, the left one that he's missing um, uh, and the other one is completely intact. So we don't view him as a Petsua Daka. That's also in Masechus Yuvamos, that a Petsua Daka, a man who um, has his testicles uh, crushed, uh, if you'll uh, pardon the, uh, the, the language, um, was um, not allowed to marry freely within the, the Jewish community. However, Rabbeinu Tam says if it's only one, left one, uh, so uh, then he's allowed to get married. Says the stipler gone. Uh, the man's not going to be able to marry unless he relies on Rabbeinu Tam. So he's allowed to rely upon Rabbeinu Tam. Either might be families that he wants to marry into that don't want to rely upon Rabbeinu Tam. He doesn't have to tell them. He doesn't have to tell them. He says, based on this Gemara, based on this Gemara, you don't have to disclose all of the defects. Um, and he says, uh, furthermore, as long as he doesn't outright lie, and say something that's not true. So he hasn't violated any prohibition of lying on a derice on a Torah level. So therefore he says it's all fine and good. Now, later Postkim said that they drew a distinction. The Nishmas of Ram, Avram, 
in his collection of medical halacha um, uh, opinions, um, it says, he quotes uh, from uh, Rav El uh, who says that maybe you could draw a distinction between not divulging the fact that there was a non-Jewish father, which has no real impact on uh, the physical state of the marriage. It's a halachic uh, a defect, which isn't really a defect. So anybody who had the audacity to go against the psak of Rabbi Yehuda to say, oh, we shouldn't marry such a person. So they're going against the halacha by considering this a defect when it's not really a halacha defect. So that doesn't need to be disclosed. But a person has something, some sort of a physical defect, even if it's really something that uh, can be lived with and uh, can be okay. And maybe the woman after the fact wouldn't uh, divorce her husband, but it, that's something that has more of an impact upon the chaye issues, upon uh, the day-to-day -day life of uh, the couple. And uh, therefore there is uh, more of a basis uh, to require that that information be uh, be, di be divulged. That's how Moshe Sternbach has uh, this uh, distinction as well between things that are mazi chaye issues. There are things that uh, they don't have to be divulged on the first date, but close to engagement. If it's something that will have an impact on the day-to-day -day life, a person has epilepsy, they have diabetes, it's uh, something that's going to impact uh, the marital relationship. It could be that uh, the woman will go along with it, that the wife, the spouse, or the husband, whoever the spouse is, will go along with it, but it's appropriate to divulge that information. That's how we generally assume. Um, however, something which uh, is not really a halakhic defect, but people think it's a halakhic defect, so says the stipler goat, and this is applied in different ways by different postgame in different situations, and I'm not saying how uh, one should necessarily implement this in every single case, going to the stipler goat, there are certain things uh, that uh, simply are not relevant. They're not relevant because the halakha has been poskin that is perfectly okay, and therefore it doesn't have to be part of the conversation. Although, of course, uh, a person uh, should not uh, directly um, uh, dissemble, a person uh, should not uh, tell an untruth, but not everything necessarily has to um, uh, has to be disclosed. Um, there is a, a, a toast. Yes. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. One truth we need to finish before Mincha. Okay, what time is Mincha? 8.15, but we need uh, to do a seum and... No problem. I'll be done in one minute. So the last thing that I'll um, that I'll mention uh, in terms of uh, the various uh, Yavamos uh, issues relating to uh, to dating and marriage. Uh, so I promised I'd give you a little bit of Yibum. Um, so what happens if a man nowadays uh, a man dies without children and he leaves a uh, and he leaves a widow, uh, and uh, he left a brother. So then we say. That the that the that the Yavama, the widow has to either do yibum has to either marry the brother because there's a uh, there's a linkage between them or do chalitza the Ashkenazim all follow the opinion of Rabbeinu Tam which is in Masechus Yavama Staf Lamed Vav that nowadays we prefer the chalitza over yibum because yibum should only be performed if a person has the most noble and virtuous of intentions so we can't guarantee that will be the case. So therefore, we always do chalitza as opposed to as opposed to yibum. What happens if uh, the uh, if the yavam, the brother-in-law, doesn't want to perform uh, ch uh, chalitza, and he does, and uh, therefore the sister-in-law is going to be stuck? Um, so it's interesting that the, there used to be a uh, there used to be a document, a star that would be signed at the time of marriage, in which uh, when a man got married and he had any brothers. So the rabbis were afraid, maybe he'll die without any children. They would have the brothers sign a, sh a shtar. They would sign a document at the time of marriage that in the event their brother would die without any issue, um, they would commit to perform chalitza. And if there was a dispute about uh, whether the chalitza um, needed to be performed or not, they would submit it to a particular bezin and they would follow the ruling of that bezin. In all of my years at the bezin, I only had one rabbi who called me to ask for such a form. Because most rabbis don't even dream of such a form. But nowadays, you really need to have a, you, you really need to think about, uh, we worry so much about Aguna situations. It's appropriate to have such a form signed, I would think, whenever there's a question mark. We had a case where a man died and um, he left uh, three brothers, and none of the brothers wanted to do chalitza with his sister in law. Why didn't they want to do chalitza with his sister in law? Because they, they, they blamed her. For being such a difficult wife, they felt that she was the one who uh, brought about the, the premature death of their brother. Um, so therefore, they didn't want anybody else to be, be burdened with marrying her. So they figured they'll do the world a favor and not perform chalitza. Um, so there happens to be a, when one of the boys um, was a Talmud of a friend of mine in yeshiva, I won't say which yeshiva, 
he was a Tamin of a friend of mine, uh, and he was going out seriously with a girl. So I pointed out to my friend who is the Rebbe that there's a halacha in Shulchan Aruch in Hilkos Yibam Machalitza that says that we don't allow any of the brothers to get married if they still have this linkage with the sister-in-law and they haven't terminated the linkage by performing a chalitza. So therefore, nobody would perform a marriage for this boy unless he would actually perform a chalitza, releasing his sister-in-law. So there, there's my friend pointed out this halacha to uh, the boy who was in his class and that boy said, oh, well, I want to get married. So he performed the chalitza. So it's good to know the halacha so, so that you can help people out in all of these dire situations. Um, so we should continue to learn all the other mesechtas as well and uh, figure out um, how to uh, apply uh, the halachos uh, to uh, contemporary uh, times and to do so in a way that's going to be as helpful as possible to members of our community. Mazel tov on this uh, Are you able to hear me, uh, Yana? Yes. Awesome. So I'll just note the fact that uh, on Kofchaf Aleph in Yuvamos, uh, it says uh, when... Uh, it says that... Uh, That when uh, Rabbi, because I'm giving you a minute. That's it. That when Rabbi Akiva was traveling, that uh, I'm sorry, it's just very distracting. Uh, when Rabbi Akiva was traveling, so uh, you know, and uh, and uh, uh, Rabbi Gamliel saw his ship sink, so he held on to the dock. And of course, uh, Rabbi Fran. I, I, don't, I know you were at the 13th CM because I saw you in the video. Were you also at the 12th CM at the... At... I was, in fact, at the 12th CM as well. You were at the 12th CM as well. So you heard Rabbi Fran reference this Gemara. So this Gemara at the end of Yuvamos, where it says that uh, Rabbi Akiva held on to the ship and able to survive. And so, too, when we hold on to the staff of Daf Yomi, Rabbi Fran cited this in name of Rabbi Mayor Shapiro, the, the, the source for the Daf Yomi, recognizing how important holding the word. So, so too, I feel like when we have the opportunity to learn Torah from you, uh, Raviona, it's really an opportunity for us to hold on to that board. And that uh, when you spoke about the uniqueness of every single person and the importance of marriage, that uniqueness certainly applies to you as well. And, uh, and of course, in that regard, of course, we're concluding with the same language that we have at the end of Mesechus Brachos at the end of the Sechus Prisos uh, and at this end of uh, uh, Mesechus uh, 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 Nazir, which of course uh, together with Yuvah, and of course this is the, the the language that we have almost exactly. Of course, in Mesechus Brachos we have the extra uh, the extra line. End of Enkelokenu. So I'll read it. Amar Rabbi Elazar, Amar Rabbi Chanina, Talmidei Chacham, and Marim Shalom Ba'olam Shenemar. Hashem, Rav Shalom Banach. That uh, every uh, Rabbi Lazar says in the name of Rabbi that the Torah scholars increase peace in the world because it says all of your sons will be the and abundant will be the peace of your sons. And of course, we say and of course, Bonayak refers to the uh, those who are Talmidei Chachamim. And certainly, that is certainly true for you, as is highlighted by the examples that you gave and the and the lessons that you taught. Uh, Help them several people, um, of course, many more people than you even mentioned here, but uh, even in just the examples that you focused on, uh, how you brought peace to the world through uh, through the ability. And so as a result, we can say, really, it's a, a beautiful thing to be able to done. So I'll do the Hadron now. So Hadron Allah, Masechus Yavamas, Bahadra Kalan, Daita Kalan, Masechus Yavamas, Daita Kalan, Lonis Hashem and Nakhus and Sechus Yavamas, Lonis Hashem and Nan, Loba Alma Dain, Loba Alma Dahasi, Hadron Allah, Hadron Allah, Masechus Yavamas, Hadra Kalan, Daita Kalan, Masechus Yavamas, Daita Kalan, Lonis Hashem and Nakhus and Sechus Yavamas, Lonis Hashem and Nan, Loba Alma Hadain, Loba Alma Dahasi, Hadron Allah, Masechus Yavamas, Hadra Kalan, Daita Allah, Masechus Yavamas, Daita Kalan, Lonus the shame in Akhman Sekhas, the Obama's losses in Jamie Nan, Loba Alma Hadain, Beloba Alma de Asi. He wrote some of Hanaka and I will hand away with Seno, Hesha Raskab and Musenum, the Oloma Zep, the same Manu Oloma Ba, Panina Bar Papa, Rami Bar Papa, Nakman Bar Papa, Akai Bar Papa, Abba Bari Bar Papa, Rafram Bar Papa, Rakish Bar Papa, Surka Bar Papa, Adapar Papa, Daruba Papa.
Amen. 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 Razzle